Some years ago, in 2008, at a football game in Grapevine, something unusual happened. Grapevine Faith High School, a Christian school, was to play the Gainesville State School, which is a maximum security correctional facility 75 miles north of the Dallas-Fort Worth area. And every game that that facility plays is on the road. It's a, a, a facility for young people, 14 to 18. And as a part of the, what they do at that school is they had a football team and they would go and play different schools that would allow them to do so. And the head coach at Faith High School is, was at the time Chris Hogan, and he wanted to do something nice, something kind, for the Gainesville people. Faith had never played Gainesville, but he already thought he knew that what the score would be, for after all, Faith was 7-2 in the year, and Gainesville was 0-8. And, and had only scored two touchdowns out of those eight games. <coughs> Faith has 70 kids on the, on the uh, field, 11 coaches, latest equipment, involved parents. Gainesville had a lot of kids with convictions for drugs, assault, and robbery, many of whose family had disowned them and had never seen them since they'd been in prison. Um, they wore seven-year-old shoulder pads and used ancient helmets that had been handed down from area schools. So if Coach Hogan had this idea, what if half of our fans, for one night only, went and cheered for the other team? And he sent out an email asking the faithful to do just that. Here's the message I want you to send, Hogan wrote. You are just as valuable as any other person on planet Earth. So, of course, some were naturally confused, including his own players. And one of the players walked into his office and said, Coach, why are we doing this? And Hogan said, imagine if you didn't have a home life. Imagine if everybody had pretty much given up on you. And now imagine what it would mean for hundreds of people to suddenly believe in you. And as a result of the Coach Hogan's plea, the night of the game came and 200 or so of the faith fans sat on Gainesville's side and cheered the Gainesville players on by name. The faith fans even made a 40-yard spirit line for the Gainesville folks to run through. They made a banner for players to crash through at the end. And it said, go Tornadoes. And when the game started, the fans in the stands began to root for the Gainesville player. And the next thing you know, all the Gainesville Tornadoes are turning around to look because they've never heard this in their life as they play. And they didn't know what to do about it. One of the Gainesville players named Alex said, I thought they were confused. And then they started yelling, Defense! when their team had the ball. And I said, what? Why are they cheering for us? Isaiah, the Gainesville quarterback, said, I never thought in my life I'd hear people cheering for us to hit their kids. I wouldn't expect another parent to tell me, tell somebody to hit their kids, but they wanted us to. And by the end of the game, it was a score of 33 for Faith, 14 for Gainesville. But they were so happy that they gave their coach, Mark Williams, a sideline squirt bottle shower like he just won state. Probably the first 0-9 shower any coach had ever had. And it was a strange experience for boys who most people cross the street to avoid. One of them, by the name of Gerald and Alignman, who was doing three years for his criminal behavior, Said, no, we can tell people are a little afraid of us when we come to the games. You can see it in their eyes. They're looking at us like we're criminals. But these people, they were yelling for us by our names. And after the game, the two teams went to the middle of the field to pray. And that's when the coach, I mean, when the quarterback from Gainesville, Isaiah, said, can I pray? And nobody knew what he was going to pray. As far as they knew, he had never prayed. And when they bowed his head, he said, We have, uh, I mean, Lord, I don't know how this happened, so I don't know how to say thank you. But I never would have known. There were so many people in the world that cared about us. 
What a heartfelt prayer from a young man who didn't know how to pray. And as the tornadoes walked back to their bus under guard, they each were handed a bag for the ride home that contained a burger, some fries, a soda, some candy, and a Bible, as well as an encouraging letter from one of the faith players. The Gainesville coach saw Coach Hogan and grabbed him by the shoulders and said, you'll never know. You'll never know what your people did for these kids tonight. You will never, ever know. And the truth is, when you and I do things for Jesus Christ, we may never know the outcome. We may never know what kind words spoken at, at Walmart or some other place may change a life forever. We never, may never know when you and I passionately pursue Christ, when we passionately pursue the cause of Jesus Christ by just being His vessel in this world, how we might impact the people of this world. We, we never know how, how, how you and I can change a life until we do it. You see, when we pursue Christ, when we passionately pursue the, the things of Jesus, what we find is that the people who make a difference in the world, no matter how small or large that world may be, those who make a difference are those who listen to Jesus Christ. You know, you've got the movers and the shakers of the world. They're doing all sorts of things out there, some good, some bad. But all of that will one day perish and be burned up in the flame. And that which will stand the, the time, the, 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 the flame of time, the flame of judgment, is that which was done for Jesus Christ. And that's what you and I are called to do. We have to fulfill our job, we have to fulfill our family duties, etc. But in the process of all of this, we are to be the obedient, passionate people of Jesus Christ. We are to be pursuing folks in the name of Jesus because our world is going to hell and the eternal value of their lives is unknown truly to you and I. I don't think we can grasp the fullness of their eternal value. I think only God gets that. And he just puts a little bit of us on us. And so this morning, we're going to continue our look at Acts. We're going to look at Philip. We, we've already touched on him a couple of times. And, and now we're going to look at him as the effective evangelist. Uh, so if you'll turn to Acts chapter 8, verses 4 through 8. We're going to read that. Acts 8, 4 through 8. When you find it, you can stand. Acts chapter 8, verses 4 through 8. We've actually read this one before last week, but we're going to do it again, and then we'll look at a few other verses. <clears throat> so, so those who were scattered went on their way preaching the word. And Philip went down to a city in Samaria and proclaimed the Messiah to them. And the crowds were paying attention to what Philip said as they listened and saw the signs he was performing. For unclean spirits, crying out with a loud voice, came out of many who were possessed. And many who were paralyzed and lame were healed. So there was great joy in that city. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this word today. We ask that you just use it to glorify your name, lift it up, and encourage us, your people, that we might once more be encouraged to passionately pursue the things of your life, that we might hear your voice and be obedient to that voice as you lead, guide, and direct us in your paths. It's in that name of Christ we pray. Amen. You can be seated. Now, when we talk about Philip, we, we discussed some of the things about him in the past already. Uh, but one of the things that we, we need to be reminded of is over in Acts chapter 6, 1 through 7, that the seven men that were chosen there to be the first deacons of the church had been uh, told by the, the, uh, the, the characteristics that the church had been told that they needed to be filled with knowledgeable, uh, full of wisdom of the Holy Spirit and so forth. And, and indeed, they chose Philip because he was a spirit-filled servant. Now, now, when we talk about being spirit-filled, we Baptists, we get nervous about that. When we think um, someone being spirit-filled is going to be jumping up and down or speaking in tongues or, or running around the church or something like that, and, and we see that on TV and we go, that's not what we want to think of when we're spirit-filled. That's not what we want to be. Um, but that's not what it means in Scripture. Every time we find someone who is mentioned in Scripture as being spirit-filled, this is a person who is literally 
listening to the Holy Spirit, being obedient to the call of the Holy Spirit, and going wherever the Holy Spirit leads. So spirit people, spirit-filled people, are people who are mindful of the work of the Holy Spirit in and around their lives, and being obedient to go and to say that which God is directing them to do. So that means every Christian really should be a spirit-filled individual. Now, obviously, that's not the case. And the apostles made our case over in chapter 6 when they said, find someone who's spirit-filled. And the implication being that not everybody in the church, even at that early of a stage, was already listening and being obedient to the word of the Lord. It's someone who was sold out to Jesus, somebody who was sold out to being obedient to the word of the Lord. And they found those men over in chapter 6, Philip, Stephen, and so forth, and they all had the same characteristics, and they all had the, some of the same attitudes, and they were able to minister to the people of that early church. And Philip was a spirit-filled person. He did what God called him to do and told him what to do. And as a spirit-filled person, we find that he is also a radical reformer. Now, this is not uncommon when people get spirit-filled. You say, what does it mean to be a radical reformer? Really, what I'm really talking about, personally, for you and I, is that we do what God tells us to do. Now, you look at our church today, the church of Jesus Christ across the denomination, across the, uh, the, the, the world and the country, and, and you find many churches that are just interested in their own thing. They're interested in just themselves. But the radical reformer within the church is the one who is going outside the walls of the poor church, who without any concern or consideration of what people think about them, and are going out and telling others about Jesus. They are doing whatever they can to tell others about Jesus. They don't care if they go to work and people call them a holy roller. They don't care if they call them the preacher. They don't care if they make fun of them because they have a task that has been set before them by God. They have been called to go into the world as a minister of the gospel of Jesus Christ to share that gospel with anyone who will listen. And to this world, that is radical, especially in today's day and age. We're just not the most popular people around anymore, are we? Christianity is just not at the top of everybody's list. In fact, we've moved way down the list. and People think very poorly of Christians. They think we're a lot of things that we're not. Haters and, and judgment, judgmental people and so forth. Based on a few individuals who claim Christ. But the reality is you and I are called to be radical reformers within the church and within this world. We look at what Philip did, and Philip was one who has his radicalism recorded here in Acts 8, 1 through 4. He, he was not a man who was going to let over 700 years of biasness get in his way. He's like, hey, God's calling me to Samaria. I'm going to Samaria. I don't know when God showed up and said, Hey, Philip, I want you to head Samaria, all this persecution starting. So let's go there and share the gospel. I don't know if, if Philip went, No, I don't want to do that. I, I, it doesn't seem like Philip's that kind of guy. In, in fact, I think Philip had probably already, even before the event happened, and saying, Hey, God, when, when Jesus was here, he said that we we're to be his witnesses in, in Judea. Jerusalem and Samaria, and as far as I know, no one's gone to Samaria. Are you sending me there? You see, it is possible, and Scripture doesn't say this, so understand, it's possible that Philip had already been being worked on by God, getting him ready to be the radical reformer who would go to Samaria. Because no Jew in that day and age was going to go to Samaria. Over 720 years before when the Assyrians had defeated the northern kingdom of Israel and shipped everybody out and shipped other people in, those who had been um, left behind began to intermarry with the pagans that were shipped in. And the people of Judah grew to despise 
the half-breeds of Samaria. They hated them. In fact, as you see with the parable of the Good Samaritan, um, if, if it, the Samaritan had been the one beaten, nobody ever would have helped him. That was kind of the implication there. But the Samaritan helps, and it seems to be odd because he has been mistreated his whole life. He was not treated well by a Jew, and yet he took care of a Jew. And even Jesus, when he went into Samaria, to that village of Sychar, and he spoke to the woman at the well, the apostles were very confused. They didn't really want to be there. They were uncomfortable because they were crossing their barriers that they had been taught not to cross. In the eyes of many of the Jews, the Samaritans were beyond redemption. They deserved to go to Hades, but not in the eyes of Philip, the radical reformer. And so when persecution broke out in the early church and the church began to scatter here and there and throughout the world, God placed his command upon Philip to go to Samaria. And Philip, in obedience to the command of the Holy Spirit who was leading him, went to Samaria. He didn't just decide to avoid persecution by going to Samaria. He was ordered to go there by the Lord. <clears throat> Once in Samaria, Philip began to do what he did well. He began to preach the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ. He began to tell people about Jesus. And the power of God was so great upon him, as we just read, he did miracles and he cast out demons. This is not Philip being lifted up and glorified. This is God being lifted up and glorified through the work that Philip was doing and that God was doing through Philip for his own sake. He made himself known, and as a result, the people of Samaria began to see that they too were loved by God, and that God concerned himself with them. And as Philip shared the good news of Jesus Christ, we see that they began to receive that good news and be saved by grace. But his breaking of barriers wasn't finished with this work. We find over in Acts chapter 8 verse 26, if you look over there, it says, An angel of the Lord spoke to Philip, Get up and go south to the road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is the desert road. So he got up and went. And there was an Ethiopian man, a eunuch, and high official of Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, who was in charge of her entire treasury. He had come to worship in Jerusalem and was reading, I mean, he was sitting in a chariot on his way home and reading the prophet Isaiah aloud. The Spirit told Philip, go and join that chariot. And Philip ran up to it. So here you have Philip. He is involved in a vital and ongoing ministry in Samaria. He is seeing people get saved. By the droves, they're coming to the Lord. He is being able not just to preach, but I'm certain he is discipling some of these who has come into the kingdom, who have believed in Jesus Christ. And part of his preaching is probably more of a, a discipling, an explanation of who Jesus is and the work that God has called him to do. <clears throat> and it's enjoyable. I tell you, any preacher worth their salt want to see what was going on in Samaria. When we want to see people wanting to hear more about Jesus, getting saved, and then even going out and doing it themselves and telling others. And so what is a revival in, in Samaria that is going on that is just taking off? It's good stuff, wonderful stuff. And in the midst of all of that, God shows up to Philip and says, leave. Now, a pastor who's in the midst of an ongoing ministry that is incredible like this really doesn't want to leave. He doesn't want to go somewhere else. He wants to continue to, to build and to put himself into the ministry and, and see these things that are happening to, to continue. But Philip is obedient. He hears the word of the Lord and that God tells him as we saw there in, in verse 26... Go down to the middle of nowhere where no one's at. That's what it means there, verse 26. That, that road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is a desert road. It is a road 
that very few travel, but I want you to go there and do it. Now, it takes about two days to get where he is in Samaria to this road. So God tells him to leave on a timetable. Philip is obedient. He immediately gets up and leaves. Because you see, God has it set up so that Philip will arrive as a chariot is going by. This is not an accident. It is purposeful and intentional on God's part. So, Philip has to leave his ministry in Samaria, go to a place where few of anyone lives, and instead of arguing with God, we find that there's no hesitation. He just gets up and goes. He doesn't say, but God, the people of Samaria are being so responsive to the gospel, I've got a responsibility to be here. He doesn't make any excuses. He just gets up and goes. He understood that he was on assignment by God, and God had the right to change that assignment at a moment's notice. So he goes, he gets there, and what's amazing is when he gets there, the God-ordained event takes place. He shows up, and he just happens to show up at a time that there is a, a, a chariot carrying this individual along the road. Now, what he sees in this chariot is a well-dressed, official-looking black man riding in the chariot who is very, very well off. Now, this guy's got several things going against him from a political political point of view. First, he's black. Now, this has nothing to do with race. This has to do with politics. Black people were known to work for the Egyptians and were often in the employ of the Egyptian government, and therefore they could be dangerous to a Jew. So it was very political in that sense. He is associated with Egypt because of his skin color and supposed political bindings and my guess would be there is some sort of identifying mark that actually connected him to Egypt and Candace, the Ethiopian. Three, he was a foreigner, which is not necessarily a bad thing, but many times the Jews would not look well upon that. He was a eunuch. Now, this one Philip couldn't have known until after the conversation, um, but it might have been a thought in his head because uh, people who were a eunuch were not allowed to enter the temple because they had purposely destroyed their manhood. And finally, he's a wealthy politician. All of these things together say that, hey, maybe we ought to leave this guy alone. But not to Philip, the obedient orator, the one who is speaking the word of God, the one who is uh, glorifying the Lord God wherever he goes. He sees the uh, chariot. And, um, as we'll see here in a minute, God's going to tell him to go up to the chariot and he'll obey but he is there in the position to do what he needs to do because he has been obedient. You see, we often are told by God to do things. And if you're like me, I've been known to argue with God. I've been known to say, I don't know about that God. I don't understand. Why are you doing it? And so forth and so on. And God will, uh, he will often make it known what his will is no matter what. Uh, he, he wants us to be obedient. Sometimes, sometimes God will explain himself or at least give a tiny bit of explanation to help our faith on the road. In fact, there's nothing wrong with us saying, God, can you give me some information? Um, we see that in Scripture is, hey, cast all your cares on him, but also come to him and say, Lord, what's going on? What can I do? How can I do it? Why should I do it? There, there's nothing wrong with these kind of questions. But you and I are to be obedient to the Lord God because He has things that He is setting up that have been set up by His hand so that you and I might be in the right place at the right time to have a divine encounter with somebody in His very name. We, we never know when or where that will take place. But if we're obedient, we will be where we're supposed to be at that time. Following this event, we find that he's a thoughtful theologian. Um, as Philip is walking beside the chariot, he hears that the man is reading from the book of Isaiah. Um, God prompts him to address the man in the chariot by saying, hey, do you understand what you are reading? <coughs> now, this man has come from Ethiopia to worship. He can't go into the temple. Uh, in fact, 
it is, I understand it right, he can't even reach the temple door into the common area because of his position as a unit. He can't even get in any of it. He can just stand in the courtyard outside of the temple and worship from afar. So he has come, despite this, probably knowing this, he's still come and worship the God of Israel. And now he's reading Isaiah, trying to understand what he's reading. And he is reading, if you look there in verse 32, it says this passage he was reading was this. He was led like a sheep to the slaughter, and as a lamb to a shearer. As a, as a lamb is silent before a shearer. So he does not open his mouth. In his humiliation, justice was denied him. Who will describe his generation for his life is taken from the earth? And that is out of Isaiah, and it's speaking to Jesus Christ. So here's Philip walking beside the chair, and here's this man read that passage out loud, and God says, talk to him about it. And so they begin having a conversation, and an odd thing happens. A wealthy individual who is a political figure riding in an incredibly well-endowed um, chariot with a commoner of no report standing next to him is invited to get into the chariot with this eunuch and explain what he's reading. Unheard of. Doesn't happen that often unless God's involved. And that kind of stuff happens a lot when God's involved. Barriers are broken, walls fall, people listen. When we're obedient, things happen. And this thoughtful theologian named Philip is now able to take what he this man was reading in the book of Isaiah and explain to him the gospel from this passage. Because it is a passage about Jesus Christ. My guess, even though we're not told everything he says is that he began to explain with him Jesus from the beginning of his ministry and how this was played out in the life of Jesus. Not sure how long it took. We, we don't know uh, how quickly the, the unit grasped the significance and his need for salvation, but we do know that as a thoughtful theologian, he is able to share the gospel and that this man receives the gospel of Jesus Christ. And how do we know that? Because it, look at verse 36. Now as they were traveling down the road, they came to some water. And the eunuch said, look, there's water. What would keep me from being baptized? Now the point there is that this guy has realized that baptism is necessary as a sign of salvation. Not as a sign to be saved, or I am being saved by it, but as a symbol of his salvation. And what he is saying is, I want to be baptized as a symbol of my faith in Jesus Christ. The thoughtful theologian, Philip, in obedience to Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit, leaves a fruitful and multiplying ministry in Samaria. He goes to where nobody lives and leaves an individual to the Lord who nobody but the Lord really knew was going to be there at that moment. And as a result, history says that this gentleman took the word of Jesus back to Ethiopia and began to preach it. And then he began to share the gospel with those in Ethiopia. And a church actually started in Ethiopia as a result of the ministry of this individual. Now that's history. That's, we don't know much other than what is written. And there's very little way to verify it other than to say this is what they wrote. So we can believe it or not. But we never know the extent that God will use our obedience. How far the arm that he is, how far his arm will spread when he uses us. We might share it with somebody, he will take it to share it with somebody, and so on down the road. And one day we may get to heaven and find that there's a great cloud of witnesses as a result of you and I sharing the gospel. Because of our obedience and our being able to tell others. <laughs> 
Now you would think after this event that Philip would head back to Samaria where the fruitful ministry was going on. But we see in verse 40, that's not the case. Actually, we'll read verse 39. It says, when, the, when they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord carried Philip away, and the eunuch did not see him any longer, but went on his way and rejoiced. So we have a miracle of translocation. Philip gets out, baptizes him, lifts him up, having been obedient to God, God goes, I need you somewhere else now, and moves him. Because the implication of that right there is not that he just walked off and Philip didn't ever see him again. Like he came up and he was gone. And he appeared, as we see in verse 40, it says Philip appeared, indicating again a miracle taking place, in Azotus. And he was traveling and preaching the gospel in all the towns until he came to Caesarea. Now, Azotus is a town that is on the uh, seaboard side of Israel today. Or it's not called Azotus anymore. Uh, but it was an area that used to be controlled by many of the enemies of Israel. <laughs> Pardon me. So, as the... Uh, eunuch is baptized, Philip is translated here, and it says that instead of heading back to Samaria from this place, he began to travel and preach the gospel in all the towns until he came to Caesarea. He was a wandering witness for, for the gospel of Jesus Christ. And where the Philistines used to live in that area, remember he was on the road going down to Gaza, so Zotus was north of what was Gaza at the time. And he lands there, began to preach all the way up where this land had been pagan filled. And, and while the, the paganism of the Philistines was gone, many of the practices of the Philistines were not. And the people in that area practiced a, a mixed religion of different things. Some from the Philistines, some from the Jews, some from here, some from that, the Egyptians, all sorts of stuff. And what Philip did is he became a wandering evangelist. A wandering witness to the gospel of Jesus Christ, and that he took the message and worked his way up the coast in obedience to the Lord all the way to Caesarea, where eventually Peter will show up and be at. His obedience touched an unknown number of people. All we are told here is 40. In first 40 is that Philip appeared and he traveled north, basically in all the towns until he came to Caesarea and we're not told of any of the results. Now we can assume some of the results though. That as Philip began to, to, to work his way up from Azotus to, to this village and that village preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ according to what we have seen in the ministry of Philip up to this point people got saved. People accepted Jesus Christ. People heard the gospel and received the gospel and their lives forever changed as a result of the gospel. And while we are not told that, that is something that we can kind of assume. It's almost like Philip with an early day Billy Graham going wherever he could to preach the gospel in accordance to the word of the Lord so that he might be obedient to the news, the good news that he's preaching. And even though Philip may not have understood the fullness of his ministry. He was obedient to a fault. He reached the Samaritans, which is a group of people nobody would have wanted to reach. He reached the eunuch of Candace of Ethiopia, which is a group that nobody might have thought to reach. And then he worked his way up the pagan land along the sea of uh, uh, the Mediterranean Sea where nobody might have wanted to reach. He consistently went where he was told in obedience so that he might bring honor and glory to his Lord, Jesus Christ. The last we hear of Philip in the Bible is his name is mentioned in Acts chapter 21, 8 through 10. Now this is at the tail end of his ministry. And there it is mentioned that he has settled down and gotten married. He's had four daughters and we are told are prophetesses. Prophetess, yeah, like saying Mississippi. So when do you stop? 
And there, what we find in verse 9 of Acts chapter 21 is that he is called Philip the Evangelist. And the word evangelist means the bearer of good news. The carer, the carrier of good news. He is seen by his peers as one who consistently evangelized those he met. And what a fitting title for a man who engineered and pioneered bringing the gospel into three different places. That's almost like God saying this is his epitaph. Could have put it on his gravestone, Philip, the evangelist, God. Because that is how God saw him. But all Philip was doing was being obedient to the Holy Spirit. And even though Philip's story is spread throughout three different chapters of the Scripture, four different chapters of Scripture, he makes an appearance and is gone. Unlike John, Peter, Paul, who have multiple appearances and it seemed to be built, the Scripture seems to be built upon what they did, it's almost like Philip is still just a cameo. Here he is. Oh, he's gone. And yet the work that Philip did was foundational. For the laying of the gospel of Jesus Christ through three different lands. God did not see fit to tell us his whole story. Throughout scripture we see other people who are mentioned. As, a, as I said a while ago in chapter 6 of, of Acts. There are seven deacons chosen. They're all given by name. And we only know the story of two. And then we don't even know the complete story of Philip. We're only given a partial picture. And the rest of them we can hope and assume that being spirit-filled, obedient men of God, they too went out and did what God told them to do. But Philip, Philip is a good example of someone who passionately pursues God's power and purposes in this world for the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ. He is to be our example. He was a common man. Not an apostle. He was chosen out of the church and used by God for incredible things. And so can you. God has chosen you. God has called you. God has said that you can be obedient to Him and do impossible things in His name. Improbable things. Difficult things. And that if you and I will share the gospel wherever we go and in whatever we're told to do, it can make a difference in eternity. We do a lot in our world for today that has no impact on eternity. But each of us are called to impact eternity. He wants people like Philip. And you and I can be that person. Let's pray.